The more I learned about you, it's intimidating. You know, when people say like, you gotta live life by a certain amount of rules, there is no rules. You were bribing teachers? Oh, I was bribing teachers, I found it How do you bribe it? Like you gave oh, them money? How do you bribe no, a teacher? No, with food. Hold on, let's dig into this for a second. The only non-replaceable thing in our life is time. So when I say money is energy, it just comes down to how much energy are you willing to exchange to get the energy back that you want? What's that end goal? What's that vision you have? A hundred million dollars of net worth in the next 36 months. Today, I speak with Rohan Sheth, the guy who took his business from struggling to $20 million in revenue and a client list that includes industry leaders Dean Graziosi, Lewis Howes, Shanda Sumter, Ed Milet, and Russell Brunson. What is it that people get wrong about business? If you started thinking small, if I'm thinking small, if we're all thinking small, what is it that we're getting wrong? The biggest thing I think people get wrong in business, number one, I think, well, there's two, there's two parts to it, right? One is people think it's easy which is definitely not. And you know, I'm the first one to come out the other side and say it's easy when you, if you're committed to it, but you have to be willing to commit to it. And two, they do it for the money. They don't do it for the purpose and the value that they can bring. Because, and that's where the easiness and the money correlate together. And then it's soon, and that's the reason why most businesses and what's a cliche team, one in five businesses fail in the first five years is because they're chasing the money, not the value that they can drive. Hold on, let's dig into this for a second. We're going to come back to this, but they think it's easy. It's not easy, but it's easy. <laughs> what makes it easy? Explain what makes that it more. Easy is just you got to be like relentlessly persistent, right? Like, you just got to, as long as you can get your mind bought into the fact that, hey, I'm doing this to serve an ever greater number of people, no matter what comes in my way, I'm not stopping, then it's easy. Right, like that's that's just my, my my ethos, my mentality around it. Like I don't care. It's like you could go on tomorrow and write Facebook statuses about how I'm a scam artist and you know friends like it literally happening like stuff that people like think that I got into this industry thinking I was just going to create some online course and stuff like that just because I had no experience doing it. And I was like, these guys just don't understand the bigger vision as to what I'm seeing. They don't understand why I'm doing this. They don't understand my past history of family and everything else and what drives me to help these businesses turn around. And once I got completely bought into that idea, not even the idea, just bought into the purpose really of the value that I can bring to, you know, not only the people, myself, not only the people that work within my company, but the clients that I can serve. That's what really changed for me specifically. And earlier on, I thought it was easy because I came from a door to door sales background. I was able to, I did door to door sales for two years on the top producing salespeople in Canada. Canada, I was like, I can go door to door and sell a bunch of small businesses. And I did, but I hated it, right? Like that's kind of where it was. And I, but I, at that point in time, I was chasing the money. I wasn't chasing the purpose. And it got to a point where I just literally lit the company on fire, like by force, essentially not realizing that I did that. And then I had to take a step back and realize, okay, am I doing this because I just want the money? Am I doing this because I want to actually serve a bigger, uh, bigger mission? So let's actually do a bit of a step by step here. So take me back to I know your family wasn't originally from Canada. I believe that though that there was wealth in the family growing up. What was your family doing and and give me all that history? In short as possible, I can give you in terms of so born in India. Uh, my dad and my uncle started a very successful travel agency, which ended up being the top two travel agencies in all of India. Offices all around the world, Dubai, London, Switzerland, Asia, Australia, like all over. Eventually, my family ended up opening an airline, which was the very first low-cost carrier airline for India. Obviously, the bigger you get in India, the more corruption comes with itself because being a third world country and the government and everything else, that started to essentially break the entire family apart, break the business apart. My dad and my uncle yeah. ended up splitting. It was pretty vicious. How old are you? here how old are you um i would have been about six at this point in time six or seven um so, so early on i mean there's a lot of money i mean like people don't open airlines without money right yeah, so there's a lot of money early on in eh? context till the age of 11 i did not know economy class existed <laughs> let's let's put that into correlation for example okay that's the lifestyle that i kind of grew up in i was in like you know when emirates first launched their flagship flight on the triple seven my mom and i were in the very first plane that ever flew first class on that like she has like a certificate showing like we were the very first triple em like emirates today everybody knows about it what it is today but it's like going back you know decades ago so it's like that's the kind of like maids drivers every long weekend or so i was in a different country whether it would be dubai thailand london it didn't really matter like it was just it was nuts like the lifestyle that i'd seen and what what kind of you know that the cliche like born into a silver spoon is like more born into like a golden spoon kind of situation. But you know, the highs, the highs, the lows, the lows that come just in, in direct correlation and proportion to it. At the age of 11, my, you know, there was some stuff that happened with corruption and stuff. My parents decided to up and leave and just give up everything they had there and built there as a family. 
moved to Canada, to Vancouver, and literally moved to what would be considered like, you know, lower socioeconomic part of Vancouver. And in the time, in my head, I'm like, ah, I'm moving to the Western world. Like everybody's watching the movies, moving to North America. Like that's literally all I'm thinking. So I never know any different. But what really started to click for me is watching, you know, my dad had to get a job. My mom had to get a job. I've never seen my mom work for 12 years in her life. Being around for 12 years, I've never seen her work. I'd always been with her, like traveling the world and all this crazy stuff. I had to take care of my brother. Like it went from like all that. Like it, was, <laughs> it went from oh, flying shot. first class around the world and having uh, like I just picture you as a little boy like Richie Rich, like driving go karts inside the house and stuff yeah, like that. Almost, <laughs> like, yeah. Except we didn't have that because in India, you, like buying those big houses just don't make sense. And so, like where we live specifically, it's all in high rises and stuff. Um, but yeah, literally, it, it could have been anything I wanted was pretty much. And, you know, within the reach of my fingertips. How much of an adjustment was that for not just your parents, but I mean, you're young, right? But that is a very informative age to go from one type of life in one country and one culture with one level of wealth to suddenly, hey, I'm going to quote unquote, a richer nation. And yet you're down the down the economic scale, right? It was probably one of the hardest things that I didn't realize in the time, obviously, because you're a kid and as a kid, you're so malleable. Probably one of the hardest things going back, and I've done a lot of personal development around it now that I probably ever went through, um, you know, from a conscious and subconscious mind to understand the levels of polarity and, you know, like the stuff that I deluded, what I'd seen to what I saw to the bullying to having to not even talk about it and just take care of my brother because I had to just kind of step into this, you know, older figure that at, at age 12, like no kid, like I'm literally in the point where it's like, I should be trying to figure my life out, but now I'm here taking care of my brother and all this craziness. Um, and also coming from the like the other side of it too, is like coming from a world where you're, you know, if you're not in the 99 percentile in school, you're pretty much considered like you're an idiot in school to coming here. And I'm like, this is crazy. I don't even have to study that hard and I could still fly through class. Um, <laughs> like it was that kind of world. And eventually got through all of that, you know, stabilized mom and dad kind of, you know, got their feet cemented here, kind of systems and everything else taken care of. Brother was kind of sorted. And then we, you know, got to like, been like, and a grade nine and I which I didn't realize for a long, long time, but like a burning desire started at like the age of 14 for me, like grade nine, where it's like I started working at McDonald's at a very young age, like powered through the ranks there, I was running a restaurant at the age of 18, like still not even graduated school. And I was already like one of the managers there with a lot of responsibility to the point where I was bribing teachers to let me go work full time during the day so I could never be at school. Like there's that there's you were a, bribing school. teachers? Oh, I was bribing teachers left, right, and center. Yeah. Cause I remember like how, how would how do you bribe it? Like you gave the money? How do you bribe a teacher? Uh, with food. Uh, literally. With food. <laughs> <laughs> and that's literally what it was. It got to a point where in grade 12, it got, so I went like full 180. So I went from like, hey, you gotta be the 99 percentile honor, like honor student, like everything else. to so like grade nine, grade 10, I'm like, none of this shit matters. Like it just doesn't matter. Like it was just a click in my head. And what actually mattered was driving for something bigger. So then I kind of just started to go look at okay, what do I like? So it's like, yes, I kept my basic, like whatever I needed to graduate, like the math and English and basic level science. But I started looking at other options like shop and all the stuff that I didn't really have access to. And kind of just that, but I really took, I love cars. I loved cars since I was a kid. So I did like a co-op program in grade 12 that was around pretty much mechanics and kind of doing that whole thing. And then my teacher had, had been like as my, my mechanics teacher all the way through grade from grade 10 onwards and then grade 12 comes around on my last semester i literally had my co-op so it was shop and then it would be like two blocks of like spare and then shop or it'd be like spare shop shop <laughs> spare um, that's like that's like the easiest semester ever oh, You're like bird bird courses at that point dude yeah literally it was the easiest because i already finished everything before i just made sure i powered everything before that i knew going into the end of the year i didn't really want to do anything and it was all very strategic and leveraged kind of like that's what I started to understand like how to be like leveraged thinking. It's like how do I do stuff that I can get done earlier on so I can get what I want later on, right? Like, mm. the, like there's a lot of those correlations at a younger age that I did subconsciously not knowing, but today now I'm like very conscious of when I do it. Yeah, but so any, anyways, going towards the end of it, I'm like, okay, well, I could go work full time, not be at school, but if I don't be at school, I'm not going to graduate. So I'm like, how do I figure this out here? And I built such a good relationship with my teacher. So once a week, he had to provide lunch for his daughters. Uh, dinner for his daughter, sorry, because his wife worked a night shift. And I said, I'll provide that dinner for you, but on one condition, you literally mark me here for every single day that I don't show up. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> So literally, that was the deal. So every Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever day it was, I can't remember now, but I would literally bring whatever he wanted for McDonald's for his kids. And he would take it home so he'd have to, do, so he'd have to make dinners for his kids. Oh my goodness, there's such a great lesson here, right? Like you spot an opportunity, you ask, which yeah. is ballsy as hell, because the teacher could have said, you know, like, like, shut 
back up and sit down. Um, so it's it's ballsy as hell, and then it works and it delivers. I feel like as you tell that story, I can't pull out of my memory me doing that, but that's the type of stuff that I would do that would just piss my wife off because she thought that that's cheating, right? Yeah. Absolutely and she's not. like, she's like, no, there's there's rules and there's a framework and there's a right way to go about it. And by you asking and then them saying yes, and and I I'm like, it's not cheating. We're like just figuring, like, I don't want to, I don't want to follow the a, pack. A I'm like, value. They need yeah. something. You have that something. You're training to get something you want. There's absolutely yeah. no cheating. It's win-win, right? Like yeah. everybody is winning except for yeah. the kids who are still showing up to class because they're too afraid to ask. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Even today, like it's funny because I've had a couple of like, interesting conversations with my wife too about it because she didn't just understand because like so many times I'll just get into certain negotiations. I was like, how do you get away with some of this stuff? I'm like, I just figure out what they want, give them that because I know if I give them that, they're going to give me what I want in exchange. And like that's literally what ends up happening. That's literally how I've closed some of the biggest deals in my career. You mean sales is just helping people get what they need and want, huh? That's literally it. It's like, hey, don't worry about the deal being closed. Figure out how you can get them what they want, right? Like everybody's so focused on NLP and all this crazy stuff. I'm like, don't worry, I've studied a ton of NLP and obviously through in-home selling and direct selling that I've done, but it's like, it means nothing if you just understand just normal, simple human psychology and human behavior. Like that's all you need to understand. Like just go read some simple human behavior books and understand how to deal with the human. You'll be fine. So what did your parents think of all this? Because, you know, if if they're the type of people who come from the culture where it's like, you got to get the 99%, you know, you... And I'm going to generalize here and I apologize for, okay. for my Indian audience. But, you know, you got to become a doctor or an engineer. Yeah. And if you're not those two things, then, then you must be a failure. Meanwhile, you're off, you know, into cars, taking shop, not showing up to class, managing a McDonald's. I mean, were they proud of the hustle? Were they proud of the effort and the money that you're making? Because they saw you had some drive? Or were they just like, yo... Get, get some grades, become a doctor. <laughs> yeah, there's other filler stories in between of like where I had my first entrepreneur career through the whole thing, made a hundred grand at the age of 50, at the age of 16. Well, uh, hold on, let's um, not skip over that then either. Yeah, but... <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Like, um, because I was just going through school, I think they were just blinded by the idea that I was okay, I'm just still going through school. So it's like, as long as I balance both outcomes, they didn't really care. And then towards the end, I think my mom just started to realize that this kid's just going to do what he wants to do. So just get out of his way. It's easier <laughs> for me and for him um, kind of situation. Whereas my dad really struggled with it because my dad was more of the orthodox kind of Indian mentality. right? And growing up, I always said, you know, coming from the travel background, I always said that I really wanted to be a pilot. Like that was like my goal that I'd already, like since I was two years old. So like my mom was like, since I can remember, like I love planes, literally sitting, oh, you can't see it over there. Like I love planes, I love flying, I love travel, all that good stuff. And that was the goal. So like everything that I did in high school was to make sure that I could at least get into pilots. Like I, that, that was no matter what I was getting. If I'm going to appease somebody, which I don't believe in doing that, if I'm going to appease somebody, I'm going to appease them. At least I can make sure I can go to pilot school and see if I actually liked it, which I eventually did and ended up dropping out. But that's a different story <laughs> and going down that route. So and, and towards the end, like when I went into school, to college to become a pilot, my dad obviously was like, yeah, he's going to do something big for himself. Like obviously career driven mentality, which I'm like, it's just so confusing to me because as a kid, I grew up in an entrepreneurial background, but you're telling me to go get like this like 40 hour work week job. And like, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And even going through pilot school, you know, I went and applied for BCAT, which is like our technology school here to get a pilot program. But then I figured out once again, hey, where do you guys go to school? Just asking simple questions. Where are you guys training? You're not training from here. You're not training from Vancouver International Airport. You're going to some other airports. They told me everything and I just went directly to the school. I got my call right after went directly to the school. It's like, hey, if I don't go through BCAT and I come through you guys privately, it doesn't make a difference. So literally go, you're only paying BCAT $60,000 more to get a piece of paper that says you're a pilot. I was like, well, then I'm not going to BCAT. I'm coming directly here. And I ended up challenging what was supposed to be a two and a half to three year, obviously, depending on weather, because we live in Canada. And I think it was like a two and a half year program. I did everything that they said in two and a half years in less than a year. Like just in the year mark, almost I did all of the the training, the flying, everything else. Just just by stacking your hours, just, just by stacking hustling. my hours and just getting creative around the time. Where it's like if I couldn't fly, I was doing other like theoretical stuff. When I didn't need to do theoretical stuff, I was just flying. And then it got to the end where I had to get one more certification, which was called the multi agent certification. That is essentially where you can fly like, the bigger planes and stuff. And I literally sat there with this thought in my head, and I was like, and this is when. 
all the baby boomer pilots are just coming through the ranks. And I was like at the bottom. So like pilots, you know, pilot careers go through like cyclical cycles. If you went in now, you would get into any airline you ever wanted to. And I'd applied to be part of the Emirates Cadet Program, the Cathay Pacific um, Cadet Program or Cadet Program, whatever the hell they call it. And I got applied and, and I just kind of went through and I was like, okay, I could go one way or another. But in my head, I'm like, this still doesn't give me what I wanted, which was just living the life that I had to live before. And granted, I could probably get to high six figure income, but I'm probably committing to, you know, that time, this would have been like 15 years minimum and like long mm. hours, mm. shitty schedules, mm. low seniority, like everything that comes with. Work. So at the time, at the time you were trying to rebuild or recapture this idea of what you had. Correct. Um, that's kind of what I was trying to do. And how'd that work out for you? Well, I ended up dropping out. Didn't tell my parents for three three months. Um, they, they still thought I was going to college, but it wasn't. And um, ended up getting a door to door job in the meantime. So when I said I was going to school, but I was going to door to door job. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, we can get all into door to door sales and stuff. But one thing that I, I just want to point out is I'm already seeing the pattern, but I love already the terminology you're using. When I said, "How did you do three years of courses in a year?" You're like, "I got creative." Yeah. <laughs> So, so it's not even like, well, there's a structure, there's rules, and I'm breaking the rules. You're just like, I know what I want. What do I got to do to make it work? Anything in my life now, it's like, I know what I want. What do I got to get there? You know, when people say like, you got to live life by a certain amount of rules, there is no rules, right? Like outside of even like the law, like sure, like this is being recorded, but like there is no rules to a certain point. Now, now if you go do something extremely crazy, I think I think crazy. FTX knows that there are some so, rules. Exactly. <laughs> But like in your day to day life, I'm talking about like if you want to just build something that's truly or even just having like living your life, like quit worrying about, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Like everybody lives in fear all the time. And, you know, there's certain points where I, I still catch myself in that fear mentality thing just because we're fed in, at such a young age. But then like you just have to snap yourself out of it. It's like, so what? Like, so what? What if you get caught? What if like? As long as you're not doing anything that's harmful to somebody else and you're just doing something that's going to make a bigger difference for you or you're actually just challenging yourself, who cares? Go do it. So I know that as you started your agency in 2014 and, and grew it from 100000 a month to a million a month over a few years and then almost lost it all in 2018 and had to do a major pivot and then rebuilt, I know that you've learned a lot of lessons You've, you've worked with a lot of mentors and you've connected with some of the most remarkable people, really, that I think are out there. The main reason I wanted to have a conversation with you was that I've heard that through uh, your mentors or through your coaches, that you've embraced this thinking or mindset that money is energy. Mm -hmm. Now, if our, you know, our listeners and our viewers were to go to YouTube or go to Google and type in money is energy, which I've tried to do, Grant Cardone has a video where he briefly talks about it. A few people kind of talk about it, but they get into this really weird space about it. I've heard time is money. Yeah. I've heard that time is the only commodity. But the idea that money is energy. Is this, is this something that's central to what took you from working with small businesses and, and having an agency that's up and down and almost on the verge of bankruptcy and all this stuff to building you know, an agency that takes you to 20 million or 30 million or 50 million or 100 million and the network, the networks you're getting into and the clients that you're working with? Is this, is this like a pivotal shift in your thinking? Yes. It was not to the point where the way I look at it now, but... Um... The way I look at it is like energy is always moving, right? Like it's kind of what would be the pivotal shift? Like if you understand the, the terminology energy, so you can go watch a YouTube video on how energy works and the levels of it and kind of like all the different states and kind of where it comes from, is you all of it comes back down to how what you feel and what you're putting out there. As much as this can kind of get woo-woo to a certain degree, it's like metaphysical as it can get, it's proven over and over and over again. Right. Like the simplest state of form for a human being is meditation. Right. Like that's kind of coming down to sitting with your thoughts and being okay with it. That's controlling your energy. Now, if I can control my energy, I can also control my output and what I get. And I can also control the input and what I want. So when I do that, now a lot of the times is, you know, I'll go through highs and lows. Like this entire year of 2022 has been one of the most challenging years of my life for business. But I've also known that, you know, it comes, energy is also balanced. So it's like I went through an insane high. So it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to be infatuated with this high because I know the balance is coming. And I was just, it's kind of more of a foundational reset. I'm getting ready for another run and I can feel it. I can literally feel the difference in the change in the team and the people. And I can feel it within myself of the big changes coming. So when I say money is energy, it just comes down to 
How much energy are you willing to exchange to get the energy back that you want? Yes, time is money. Everything, all that, all that stuff makes sense. Like, you know, one of the things that we laugh about is that the only non-replaceable thing in our life is time. I'm willing to pay an exuberant amount of money to just shorten everything in my life if I possibly can. If that means I got to pay someone to come shovel my driveway, I'll do it because it gives me more time. Like There's like little things that I'm willing to do that you're not going to get back wasting doing that, right? But when it comes to the energy, it's like, okay, well, what do you want? What do I want? I have an end goal in mind and I know I want to do it in a certain amount of years. So you what's, know, what's that end goal? What's that um, vision you have? So for me, it's $100 million in the next 36 months. A hundred million in revenue, a hundred million in, in net profit. A hundred million dollars of net worth in the next thirty six months. Okay. And you know, me and one of our close friends, we've had this very, very deep conversation about it. And I said, "What do I need to do? You get if you you've seen this happen. You've seen this happen through multiple private equity companies, the things that you've done, all the mergers and acquisitions, and everything else that you've done. Just give me the roadmap of what I need to do and get out of my way." Like that's literally <laughs> what I said to him. Because at that point in time, then I know what I'm at and I know my energy, my state, my being, that I will do whatever I need to. I will attract whoever I need to to come into my life to make sure that that goal gets hit. But if I why do you how do you how do you know that? How do you believe that? What what leads you to be, to say that with such confidence? You just got the point where, like, for example, I can turn this camera around and show you if you want me to, but like I got two of my old vision boards of when I literally could not afford a McDonald's coffee. Right. Icon did a video on this for me. I could not afford a McDonald's coffee. And I sat down at that point in time and I put like these two vision boards together, the most insane things I could ever think of at that time. Like you can't afford a McDonald's coffee, but you're putting like flying private, you know, fifty thousand dollar Rolexes, like all these crazy cars, all like collectible Lamborghinis. And, and when else. when was that? Um twenty four uh, end of twenty fourteen, right when I decided to launch the agency. Uh, yeah. And I put all this on here. There's not a single, I'm like, we're literally, the reason these, these, this thing is out is because we're going to shoot a video on this, kind of breaking it down and like literally quote, the house that I live in currently, where I'm shooting this podcast in, is on that vision board, exact house that I'm living in right now. Right. Like this house was built at that point in time. And I didn't, it was brand new at the time. And I just went on like our version of MLS and I took a picture of it and I put it on, not realizing, I didn't even realize when I moved in here that that was the house. And not like when, we were going through it and I was like, oh, like looking at the picture and like looking at outside. I'm like, like we're literally going to take the vision board outside and put the picture to show that it's the exact house from the outside. Uh-huh. Right. So it's like that kind of comes back down to that level. So, you know, people say, oh, man, manifestation, visualization. Yes, it is. Woo. Yes, it is. Like, and to me, it's to a certain point where it's like, you've got to understand how it works. But at the end of the day, the biggest thing is coming back down to self-belief and understanding within yourself that you can deliver on that. If you can deliver on that, you're you're willing to take 100% accountability to get there no matter what. It doesn't matter. And for me, it came back down to controlling my mind. You know, we and you know, we've heard part of my story where it's like I came from everything being given to me to everything being taken away from me to now everything that I know I've got to earn myself. Like, yes, there's opportunities that come now to a point where it's again, it just kind of put on my lap, but I don't believe anymore that it put on my lap. I've put in the years that have earned these opportunities to have these networks open. And everybody's like, oh, how do you get into these doors? And how do you get invited to these like crazy events? And all this stuff is like consistency, man. I'm not chasing something that's going to make me, you know, a million dollars tomorrow. I'm chasing something that's going to make me a hundred million dollars in a decade, right? Like, technically, yes, it's a hundred million dollars in 36 months, but that hundred million dollars backwards from 2014, it's taken me a long time to get there. So it's just being kind of holding that in my head. And now that I know that, obviously, it's a lot harder for someone to fathom where it's like, you want to do that in three years? Yeah, I want to do it in three years, but I've also committed the last 10 years prior to it that I know I can do that and compress time in three years. Yeah, I'm far enough in my career and I've been around you and others enough to know that this isn't simply ego speaking, but an outsider, someone listening to you right now who may be newer to business or may have just heard of you for the first time might go, this guy's bananas, right? Like this guy is a big talker, super egotistical, right? You talked about how on social people think you're a scam artist and all this (laughs) stuff as well. And it's a bit like the way that people who don't really understand Gary V think that Gary V is this loud mouth talking, you know, scam artist. And then the more that you dig in and the more you get to know, you, you kind of see little glimpses of the motivation and little glimpses of the, of the, um, uh, what would be the term? It, it's like he's doing it selflessly and he just wants to give you all the answers. Mm-hmm. How do you declare and, and tell people and, and even for yourself, say like 36 months from now, $100 million net worth and not think 
that's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, it's like, not, like, great. It's so not. you put, so you put seven years in previous work or ten years in previous work. It's not like you deserve a hundred million dollars. Right? No, but why not? <laughs> like, that's my question. Is why not? It sounds ridiculous. Yes, like looking like if someone is just getting into it or hearing it for the first time. But you also don't, you haven't seen the sleepless nights. You haven't seen the point where I've literally been in a drive through and you know like you know, icon to shoot videos of this. So it's like people can actually see like the depiction of what it was like living in that moment. They did such a good job. Even my previous life and my story and all that stuff. We've done all that stuff. So like all this stuff is the truth. You want to talk about my family? You can search it. Like it's public knowledge. My uncle had one of the most public suicides um, in the world at, like, at one point in 2012. So it's like all this stuff is out there. So it's like people can call you know, bullshit on whatever they want. It's like nothing that I speak is not truth. And kind of going on that route. I'm actually even trying to get a hold of the teacher right now to see if I can do an interview with them to talk about the McDonald's story because it'd be fucking funny to share that. And like his union rep's gonna be like, don't talk, don't yeah. talk. <laughs> yeah. So like that's kind of what it's gonna come down to. It sounds crazy, but here's something that I learned from one of my mentors earlier on. Who do you put yourself on a pedestal? Like if you were to put someone that you're like, oh my God, I would love to meet this person. I would love to be this person. Name one person. Who do you meet? Who I'm asking you. Uh, uh, Ramsey is my favorite entrepreneur. Gordon Ramsey. Gordon Ramsey is your favorite entrepreneur. Okay. So do you realize every single thing that Gordon Ramsey, every single trait that you see in him, you have inside of you. And as long as you can own all of those traits, the good and the bad, you automatically up level yourself to realize you can think the same way he does. That's a very shortened version of doing, seeing what I'm saying. But for me, it was like, okay, I went through every single person that I put on a pedestal. Mark Cuban, Elon Musk, all these people. And I just looked at, okay, what are the good? What are the bad? Am I willing to own both of those traits inside of me? Yes, because we have all of them. I can think the exact same way they think they did it. Why the hell can I not do it? And as soon as you get to that point, you literally take them from putting them on a pedestal to putting yourself in a pit. You balance, you come to balance equilibrium. You start, you literally start to think they with the way they think. And it changes your entire perspective of the entire world. And now if you can do this in your head, I love it. If you can believe it, it's amazing. And and I again, yeah, I, I was listening to I just finished the Will Smith book. I bought it before uh, the Academy Awards. And then after that whole Academy Award thing, I was just a little over Will Smith. I was like, yeah. I was like come on, man, how could you do this? But you know, time has passed. I listened to it. It's an amazing book. What I drew from the book was really the fact that that he believed it and he worked towards it and he wanted to be hit a certain level and he wanted to be that person and he just went out and did it. And it's yeah. like, he just, I mean, it, it wasn't easy, super, yeah. super hard. You want to build a hundred million dollar company or sorry, not even a company, a hundred million dollars in net worth in 36 months. But cool. You, you know, you're looking at all these people, these people who've done it, you're following the same paths. Now it's one thing for you to see it. And it's another thing for you to say, okay, I think I'm going to go after it. And you just even start taking action towards it. How, do people not call bullshit on you when they know who you were? When, you know, I shared with a few people um, early on, maybe three or four years ago, I was like, you know what? In 10 years, I want 20 million cash. Yeah. And I shared that with a few people and they were like, 20 million cash? Yeah. And I was like, that doesn't seem hard to me, but based on everyone's else reaction, <laughs> Apparently, it's really hard to have personally after taxes sitting in cash. I like the idea of that and not the idea of what it is, but of who I need to become in order to have that is yeah. really what the joy is for me. But suddenly, everyone's reactions, you know, people in business, people in accounting, everyone was just like, they would almost accuse me of being foolish, like being so naive. You, I, would, being I would foolish. go to like business and accounting and be like, what have they achieved? <laughs> they haven't achieved 20 million in cash. <laughs> exactly. so then you're talking to the wrong people. You're looking for validation or whoever the person is from someone that has not achieved that. But if you went to 20 million dollars, if you went to Mark Cuban or even went to Gordon Ramsay, you'd laugh at you. You'd be like, 20 million cash is a fucking piece of piss. Right. Yeah. That's that's the way you gotta start thinking. And like that's the way you play. And like if you start to really play in that game, you know, knock on wood, I've been fortunate enough now at a certain point after a lot of persistence and, and, res and resilience to get to the point of having the clients that I do, the people that I have, but it's like majority of people don't realize is like, I don't sell a lot of money at any given time. The reason being is because I'm investing at a, in, not investing as in like buying properties and everything else, but investing with my personal growth, my business growth at an exponential rate where everybody else is hoarding cash. I'm just dumping it back at what's going to help me expedite it. Yes. Yes. And so this is where it's like it, money is energy is yeah. something someone told me I've heard, but but when I started off the interview by saying like, oh, the way you do business is so different and so intimidating to me. 
Yeah. Okay. So you're 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 not hoarding cash. You're you're yeah. just like literally reinvesting and just dumping it and just dumping it. Yeah. Is that your cash? Is that someone else's cash? Like, how do you? Well, how do you... I could literally keep it my company cash for sure. It's my cash on my personal wealth side too. Uh, but you don't mind just letting it go, like just just no. let it go. Because just if I can let it go, it. I know I can go make it back faster. And why do you believe that? How do you know that? It's just money. It's replaceable. It's just, it's just money. <laughs> Right. At the end of the day, it's just even, even for me to say $100 million, like I'm sure I'll hit $100 million in 36 months. And I'll be like, all right, fuck, what do I want to do next? Right. But like, that's my goal for right now. But I want to do it because of other things where I can spend more time with family and all this other craziness. I'm not working these crazy amount of hours, but I'll still always work. I love the art. I love what I do. I love everything else. So it'll probably be different. I'll, at that point in time, I'll open different doors. I'll have different opportunities. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of it that comes down to play. I think one of the TikToks that I put out a while ago is just, Money just amplifies the person you are. Like that's really all it comes down to. If you're a greedy motherfucker, you're always going to be that person. And the more money you have, the more greed you're going to bring. And I literally went through that this year with someone, two people that were extremely close to me in my life and had to cut them out of my life, relationships, everything to a certain degree. And, you know, one of the things that why did everybody back me in those situations and not them? Because they know no matter what, I'm still going to serve. I'm not just going to do it because I just want money for, you know, just going to hoard it for myself and kind of make my lifestyle better. Like, yes, I do live a pretty damn good lifestyle, but it also comes in correlation to how much more I'm taking care of everybody else along with me. Hmm. And so how do you... Um, I almost don't know where to take... I'm just so fascinated <laughs> with the way that you think and and the lessons that you've learned and what you're doing. It seems to me that a lot of the goals and even on your dream board is is, is more materialistic stuff. But you just said that you know, you're working your ass off and you want to build this stuff so you can spend more time with your family. Wouldn't it just be faster just to spend more time with your family and not build all this stuff first? Yes and no. Because at the end of the day, it comes back down to values, right? For me, my number one value currently in life, I know is business. I know it's building something that I can serve the universe at a bigger level. I can serve people. Um, you know, at a certain point when, you know, the kids get older, all that good stuff, I'm sure my values towards... Like for the longest time, like... My family was probably while I was building my business was like not like probably like the bottom five of my top five values. Where now, obviously, by the kid and everything else has come up more. I've you know, made more of a conscious effort of spending more time with my family. But business is still number one for me. And the reason being is not just the art of business, not just the money business. It's like I know every single day the clients that I serve. Like people are like, oh, you serve these great clients. I'm like, yeah, but I'm serving their clients and getting them more reach on what they want to do. So yes, I have these big names, but the difference that I'm actually making is how many more people that they're getting to reach, right? When you sort of think for what your clients' clients are going to get, that's when you know internally as a company, you're energetically you're moving at a very different level. Like that's something that I always tell my team all the time. Like, yes, it's cool. Like, we can sit up there. And it's funny because it's like everybody, like, you know, one of the guys that I just brought on as a marketing director of my team, he's like, how on planet fucking earth do you post nothing on Facebook? Like, go on my Facebook profile, he posts nothing on Facebook and all this stuff. And he just posts this like crazy content on Instagram and TikTok, but you have all these, all these clients and I, and you never talk about it. And I'm like, because I don't fucking need to. I just let my results do it. And these clients end up referring me more business and it kind of goes from there. And it's like, yes, we're going into that phase now where we're going to start talking about it more and publicly going, talk about it more going into 2023. And like, you know, as a company, we've run over 150 million plus. Like I, we're going to do an audit at the end of, at the end of next week is what we've done in, in, you know, combined ad spend for our clients. And as a company, we've probably spent less than $20,000 in customer acquisition. And how much do you have even a guess at how much money you've spent? With uh, on behalf of your clients with Facebook and with uh, yeah, we're, with we're over, over 150 million, way over 150 million. You guys have managed 150 million dollars in ad spend, yeah, easy. <laughs> and you spent twenty thousand dollars advertising yourself. Correct. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I love it so much. It's it's so good. <laughs> but like now we're getting geared up to get into the space of where it's like, okay, we've got all of this stuff, so now I can literally steamroll through everybody. How do you not worry about delivery? Like, you know, because I've seen you hustle and I've seen you sell and I've seen you present and, you know, your revenue and your growth certainly speaks to it. But in the back of my mind, I'm, I know that with every value exchange comes a promise, yeah. right? Like, I need to put something on the line if I'm going to get you to give me some money, right? Like, I need to make a commitment to you. I need to make a promise to you. There has to be a value exchange in that way. How do you not worry about delivery as you're scaling this thing all to? crazy level so fast. The delivery comes hand in hand, right? So one of the things that in you know, what I coach agency owners as well is like everybody's so infatuated with the idea of someone's giving me money 
to deliver a service and a product to them, but they also don't realize that they're that service and product as well. So if they don't match what you need to give them that levels of service, your delivery is going to hinder. Right. So say we just did a book launch for someone pretty well known, but they refused to do any creatives. I can't promise you a book launch (laughs) if you're not going to get me your own creatives to do that. So it's like there's got to be that middle ground of meeting. Now, if you bring what I need, I know I can take my skill set and my team and my resources to get you to where you want to be. Whereas in any other situation, everybody else would just be like, you know, putting their tail between their legs and just trying to do everything to appease the client. We are so black and white. Like we're about to onboard one today, a very big name that's going to be doing a massive book launch in um, March. And, you know, they're on a tight timeline. And I'm like, if you guys do not onboard today, like literally said this to me, I said, if you guys do not onboard with us today, I cannot guarantee the results knowing that we're going into Christmas and New Year's and everything else. But like, I'm telling you, you're going to have to find another agency because I'm not going to take you guys on. And like literally at midnight last night, I saw the contracts come through the... (laughs) <laughs> onboarding the onboarding documents come through and everything else because I'm like that certain because at the end of the day if I take them on and I'm going to deliver I need to make sure that they're going to deliver on their side as well because I can't put my team up against something that in the end is going to make me look bad granted there are in every situation things that can go wrong deliveries that can go wrong but a lot of times we live in a very data-driven world what actually broke did we not deliver? Did the, was there something that happened in a certain time with Facebook or Instagram? Was your offer completely wrong for the wrong market that you thought? Let's just diagnose it and go back and give it a second round. And usually any time where something's broken and the client and I can come to a point where we can have that agreement and be like, okay, yes, we're both taking equal responsibility here. The next round, it just blows up. And, you know, there's still clients out there that'll go out and say like, these guys fucked up and they did this and they did that. And like, they're continually pointing fingers and blaming you for something not realizing there's three fing- there's three fingers pointing back at them a lot of the times. And I've gone head to head with them publicly. And it's like proven where it's like, hey, you know, telling me that I didn't do something that I just put screenshots of Slack messages inside publicly to say, let's let's talk. And then it just automatically just goes down, right? It's like, don't blame me for shit. I'm willing to take responsibility of where I didn't lift the weight, but you're just as responsible for that outcome when it comes to delivery. Do you think your approach to business is a, a fast build and then a fast fizzle? Or do you think this like this approach will really prove to work over the long haul? People think it's fast, man. Like um, I had a deal go sideways this year on an acquisition that we were looking at rolling up because their mentality and their style of business was operations, 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 and not focusing on growth. But at the end of the day, the issue with that is that yes, you, every business can scale based on operations, but every business can grow based on sales. But as long as you have the right players in both places and they can grow together, who met, who the hell gives you? Right? Like there's no right way or wrong way of doing business. And then the operations based business people end up in a situation where you're steamrolling through stuff and they're trying to steal clients from you, which is happening. And the end is that like you just have to like do certain things where it's like, I've always played the long game. Like no matter what people call it, it's like I've always played the long game. I've run some of the biggest info product launches probably out there in the last, you know, call it five to eight years that have been out there. And I only launched an info, info product to myself six months ago. Right. So it's like, it's not fast by any means. I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and say, I'm going to do something that I know I cannot back myself for at least 10 years ahead. Like if someone comes to me 10 years from now and say, what did you do with Grow Up? I want to be able to prove every single thing that I've done and make sure that no matter what anybody questions me on anything, I have the proof to show to them. So what does losing look like to you then? Are you looking at loss as just a one-sided outcome? Because in every loss, there's gain. So it's like if I've lost something, I'm gaining something somewhere else. Right? Like right now, in a perfect example, I'm in this hated battle, which, you know, there's like, we're talking about all the gains and we're talking about all on the podcast. Like, I wish we could be more open about some of the lot like, quote unquote losses, but like, you know, I've lost a company. I got a, had a company stolen from me two years ago by a very, very big um, social media platform. But in that loss, I gained a lot more clarity of what I wanted to do, right? So it's like, yes, I lost, you know, what would have been my $100 million exit in a very early stage. Um, but I also gained a lot of clarity around bigger purpose, bigger service, everything else that I wanted to go to. So I don't look at like in the moment, yes, we can sit there and, you know, beat ourselves over it and drink an old fashioned, cry ourselves to sleep or whatever the hell we want to do. <laughs> 
but get up and look at it. Okay, what did I learn from that equivalent amount? For example, right now there's a client that we're in a battle with someone that's trying to steal it from us. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, I've had this client for t- versus since 2018. They're trying to steal it from me for whatever reason, lies, bullshit they want to create. You know, people can make these facades up there. If I'm losing that, what am I gaining? I'm gaining a lot less headache. Not having to deal with it. I'm getting a lot less headache from this specific person not having to steal people from me. Like there's a lot of things that, that go on behind the scenes inside a business. I'm also gaining in equal proportion to what I'm losing. So I don't ever look at loss as just a loss. I'm also gaining while I'm losing at the exact same time. Just on the opposite side, while I'm gaining and winning, I'm also losing somewhere else. So it's like I'm never looking at it from a perspective where it's like I'm only getting one thing. I'm getting both equally at any given point. It sounds almost like you're dancing with flow. Like, yeah. like you just know that what's coming, things are going, you know, when you're earning, things are cost, which ties back into this idea of like money and, you know, you, that you can o- always earn more money. So if you're in flow, are there things that you're still trying to push? Are, you, are, there, are there certain areas where you're still trying to push the, the square peg into the round hole to make shit happen? Oh, or no. is it okay? So it's not you're not total flow where it's like oh whatever happens happens no, no all the time no and you know and that's my personality as a whole is it drives like my brother runs all of our operations and I have brought an operation consultant we're bringing in a CEO next year and all this good stuff and every single person that I brought on like today we're announcing an acquisition for a company that we just bought and like even the guy that we're bringing in I'm literally said to them I'm like my number one goal is to find ways to break shit. That doesn't make sense. That's the only way that I can do business, like in in my personal way. So it's like I'm always trying to put that round peg into the uh, into the square hole kind of situation. It drives my team nuts, but they know usually if I'm doing it, I've already thought about why. I can't sometimes put it into words and into actions. It just kind of comes to fruition if they just let it be and just do what I tell them to do. And the amount of arguments and you know like. Not I just finished first. watching Succession the first three seasons. Oh, I love it's that a, show. It's so good. I know yeah. that every entrepreneur loves it and they all see themselves as, you know, like the, the granddad or whatnot, the, the father. But there's a certain point where he's just like, where it's clear where he's just like, I win. Yeah. I win. <laughs> I win. Yeah. So don't go against me because I win. I win. Exactly. And that's kind of what it comes down to. And that's with all the relationships that I have in the industry. So, you know, I play these very strategic games behind the scenes and nobody knows that I have access to. But it all comes back now for me as I'm based on relationship, right? If I'm doing anything, if I'm if I don't have a relationship with the person first, because if I can bring them value from a relationship perspective, if I ever get myself into an oh shit moment, I know I can rely on that person. Like I can always I'm one text away from being able to open anything that I really ever need to get done. And you know, in succession, it's like a lot of the stuff that he does, if you actually pay attention to the way he moves, it's while he got to the point where he got to, he had a lot of these people that he literally just had relationships with. Yes, he looks like this asshole on one end, but he was an angel on the other end as well through his process. But now that asshole can pull on all those angel cards to get what he wants. So it's like, no matter which way you look at it, it's like, that's what I love about that show a lot of it, because you see the duality of both parts and you can actually see it from a perspective where most people will just look at him like, oh, he's just this douchebag, you know, hedge fund manager, whatever the hell he does, and just doesn't want to give his, you know, family whatever the hell they want. No, he's put all his blood, sweat, and tears to show the rest of his family he has to earn, they have to earn their way to get there. Yeah, nothing's given. No. If you think about the clients that you've worked with, what are some of the lessons? Because in my experience, every time that I work with someone, I learn just as much from the experience of working with them as they may gain. Yeah. Uh, what have you learned from, from some of the clients that you've worked with? All, I'm learning all the time, man. You know, every client teaches us something different. Teaches us how to communicate with different personalities. Like, teach, like helps me the opportunity. To- I, I mean, though, outside outside the scope of even just like standard operating procedures and getting better and things like that, like life lessons. The one that really amplified it for me is like I I did it subconsciously, not knowing. Like you know, everybody's like, "Oh, you worked with Dean and Tony and all these guys," and most people don't realize like, when I got Dean, like that's the, that's Dean Graziosi and, and, and Tony Robbins, Robbins right? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah, exactly. When I got Dean as a client in 2020, and I was just with him two weeks ago in his office, and he literally still till this day talks about what I did, and he's done it publicly. He's done it on his challenges because just he's seen like the you know the because I operate from like just essentially operate from gratitude first in a way where it's like giving somebody came to me that I had no idea who they were. And then eventually Randy Garden came to me. Obviously we know both know Randy Garden really well. And he's like, Hey, you know, Dean's in a bit of, he's had some issues with Facebook. Can you help him? And I said, sure. And he said, Randy goes, how much do you want to charge him? And I said, I'm not. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, until I know I can actually help him, I don't need to charge him. 
And I still have the audio note from Dean. Dean had no idea who I was. Didn't have a clue who that existed. And he goes, I don't know who you are. I don't know why you're doing this. But the amount of gratitude I have for you to help me get back to where I need to be, I will do whatever I need to do to make sure that this is paid in dividends in the future. That one move took me four months of my team. I literally cost my team four months of going through everything, auditing a bunch of his stuff, like hours and hours and hours to finally go and then put Grorev on the line against Facebook to make sure Dean, whatever issues he had with Facebook, to make sure that he could be back on that platform, ended up landing me, him as a client, ended up landing me, you know, him and Tony as a client. And to date, I've got one of the best testimonials. He usually doesn't give testimonials. It's on my website. Got one of the best testimonials from him. And it has opened more doors from anything else that I could ever do. And him bringing it up, and it, like I didn't realize it until he brought it up two weeks ago. And he goes, the fact you did that for me is something that I will never forget, no matter what, if you ever need anything of one text away. Hmm. Right? Like, And then when he said that to me, that's something that I learned from him because that's how he's done business. And he's always given first before asking. And I just kind of did it because I was like, sure, I could help you, but I'm not going to do it. And also knowing that it's like, I didn't want to get into myself into a situation like, yes, I got to probably charge him, you know, $20,000, $25,000, easy cash in a minute to kind of get that. But it's like, I knew there was a bigger outcome if I just delivered what I said I could deliver and then charge him for it. And I didn't even charge him for it because he ended up just becoming a client eventually anyways. And he was a client with us and he's been a client now. And, you know, Robin's Research International is going to be a client this going into 2023. Um, so it's just, it's one of those things. It's like, if I've learned anything from them, it's like, in, especially in our industry and what I call our industry is the one that we're talking about right now. You know, we work in other industries as well, but if you talk about like the direct response information industry, it's a dog eat dog world. And like most businesses dog eat dog, but it's this one is a lot more toxic than most people think. But if you just cut out that 80% and you just focus on the 20% that are actually there to build something that is actually more valuable and want to give in exchange to a larger audience, and you can all run together, you will you will last longer in this industry. That's an amazing lesson. Uh, because I think it goes against conventional wisdom for a lot of business coaches and a lot of people where it's like, don't work until people pay you. They're going to take advantage of you. Um, and that's, and, that's fully happened. Like, yeah, yeah that happens all the time yeah, too. Exactly. But, but I think back to my career, you know, like, like when I started... And it's so funny because I just didn't even realize at this time. But, but I went to film school. And when I graduated film school, I got an internship at CTV, our national broadcaster. And I only got that through a friend who told me about it. Okay, cool. So I got an internship. And then I'm doing this internship and, um, and I'm still going to the film school after I've graduated. And there's this dude struggling in the editing lab and I wanted to be an editor. Yeah. And he's struggling. I said, well, we start talking. Do you need some help? I want to be an editor. So I'm just looking for things to edit. Yeah. So I helped this dude out. That guy, it ended up being a Christmas video or something, like some kind of silly video for his company. I don't know, whatever. We, we cut it together. Like three months later, he calls me and he says, I'm leaving this company and I get to recommend who takes over the job. Do you want my job? Like, oh, oh, okay. I mean, I was just interning. Sure. Okay. So sure. literally, I got the job because of that. And then I hated working there. Yeah. But I became friends with my manager. I told my manager I hated it. He knew it. So he found a different job posting. I said, I don't have a good resume. He made my resume and he submitted me to the job that ended up taking the internet, internet marketing franchise. I was there in a year and a half. I told the CEO I wanted to start my own company. He agreed to let me leave the company and, and not rehire, but outsource the work to me. So when I started my agency, I had my first client. And it was only later when I looked back that I realized that every step I just kind of offered help for free, kind of wanted to get my foot in the door, looked for an opportunity, told people like, Hey, I don't like this, or I do like this, or I'm thinking about doing this. And somewhere along the way, they all tried to help me. <laughs> That's what it comes back down to. It's right? so just being authentic, really, which is another reason why this industry can, you know, it's got a, I've got a love hate relationship with it because it goes back down to everybody's so short sighted and thinking so like for the small terms, like especially right now, we're, you know, in the midst of a recession. I think next year's gonna be worse and everything's gonna get like tightened a lot more. So you're just gonna see a lot more of this. But it's like, you know, I, I asked Dean, I'm like, you've been through multiple of these recessions in, in this industry. He goes, just play the long game, dude. He's like, the ones that are gonna play, they're gonna think small are gonna be gone by the time we last the other the other side of it. There's gonna be another good run for us. And I go, All right, that's all I need to think about. Is like, you know, yes, sure, we're meaning to contract in certain situations, but play the long game. And that's exactly what you did is you were authentic and you just played the long game. Yeah. 
but I didn't even know that it was leading to anything. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, I didn't, really like do. it was just, you I just helped. You never do. That's the same thing with me. It's like, I didn't care. Like, I didn't care. Like, there was no ask. There was nothing. Like, I still have all the text message conversations. And then once I got it back and he's like, all right, what, like, literally it, would, it was like, all right, what do we need to do to work together? I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. Final question for you, my man. Uh, for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Fulfillment. Like, am I truly being fulfilled with what I'm doing every single day? Am I enjoying my life every single day, every single week? You know, yes, I do have moments and days where I'm like, why the f- am I doing this? Absolutely. We all go through that. But in those moments, like those are the ones where you, you look back and you ask yourself, why are you doing this? And then you kind of get out of that mode. Um, but if I'm not, in, if, the biggest thing is if I'm not being fulfilled and I'm not having fun doing it, I do not want to do it at all. <laughs> 